All right, everyone, welcome back to another episode of Bell Curve. Before we jump in, quick disclaimer, the views expressed by my co-host today are their personal views, and they do not represent the views of any organization with which the co-hosts are associated with. Uh, Nothing in the episode is construed or relied upon as financial, technical, tax, legal, or other advice. You know the deal. Now, let's jump into the episode. Hey everyone, this episode is brought to you by Maverick Protocol, a suite of liquidity tools built around an innovative AMM. Maverick helps token projects, DAO treasuries, LPs, or basically anyone in DeFi shape their liquidity with efficiency and flexibility. How, you might ask? Stick around and you're going to be hearing about them more later. Now, on with the show. Welcome back to another episode of Bell Curve. Today, Dan and I are going to be joined by Eugene Chen of Ellipsis Labs and Doug Colkett of Ambient Finance. This is going to be a really special episode. In the first episode of this season, we talked about loss versus rebalancing and the profitability problems that LPs and DEXs are facing. In this next episode, we are going to go one layer deeper and explore some of the different design decisions that DEX designers and builders ultimately have to make outside of just LVR. Now, the reason we got Eugene and Doug on here is because Eugene represents a central limit order book design and Doug represents an AMM design, but also they're building on different environments. So Eugene is building on Solana where gas constraints are much less of an issue as opposed to where Doug is building on mainnet Ethereum where gas and gas optimization is the name of the game. So this was a very interesting dynamic conversation uh, from two people who are building with from a very different set of perspectives. And it was Uh, a ton of fun. So hope you enjoy it as much as Dan and I did. All right, everyone, welcome back to another episode of Bell Curve. I am joined by my co-host, Dan Robinson. uh, And today we're going to be talking to Eugene Chen and Doug Colkett of Ellipsis Labs and uh, Ambient Finance. Guys, welcome. Thanks for having us. Excited to be here. Yeah, we're pumped too, guys. This should be a really fun episode. And uh, what we want to do is sort of dig into some of the differences in between AMMs and central limit order books. And what I think also will be really fun about this conversation is that Eugene, you are building on Solana and Doug, you are building on uh, Ethereum. So it'll be fun to kind of poke at what are some of the differences of building uh, in those different protocols with very different constraints. But maybe to just open this up at a very high level, I think many many folks who are listening to this will be familiar with these arguments and, and sort of debates that people would have back uh, back a couple of years ago, this sort of holy war in between AMMs and central limit order books. Um, you don't hear many of those debates going on anymore. And I think partially that's because the the line has started to blur a little bit in between a classical AMM and a central limit order book. But um, I'd love to, maybe we could just start at a very high level of sort of defining like the sort of value prop, right? Or sort of steelman of AMM versus central limit order book. And then if you guys think that's still an appropriate distinction, or maybe we can just take it from there. Sure. Uh, I think that's a pretty reasonable place to start. I think the debate still exists. It's just not as loud as it used to be on Twitter. And I totally agree that the lines have been blurred a little bit between uh, two like totally separate camps. And now you see some of the uh, models starting to converge towards each other a little bit. I think at a high level, the AMM and the limit order book are really just different liquidity primitives designed for different environments. So the AMM is designed for Ethereum mainnet originally, which has a pretty high cost to update, uh, to place transactions, uh, update your liquidity. And so it's very opinionated on the shape of the liquidity in the pool. You give market makers or liquidity providers a little bit less choice. The X, Y equals K example, as a liquidity provider, you kind of only have two choices. You can either place liquidity or remove liquidity. With concentrated liquidity now, uh, you can have range orders. So there's a few more parameters for a liquidity provider to play around with. And the limit order book comes from the TradFi world, the centralized exchange world, which is a world where the cost to update your quotes, the cost to quote unquote send a transaction is literally zero. And generally, these uh, transactions make it to the order book in a FIFO manner, first in, first out, whatever makes it to the matching engine first. Um, you know, orders are executed in that order. And sophisticated market makers compete to primarily on uh, providing better prices because you get more fills if you're closer to the top of the book. And market makers can place liquidity wherever they want. And I think there's still a lot of room to experiment on 
order types uh, on top of a, a limit order book. But it's sort of the, the core liquidity primitive is different because the design space is different. And so today, I think you know the AMM is clearly still better for retail liquidity providers because there's fewer dimensions on which they can get out competed. You don't need to be like running code. You don't need to be running like a separate you know AWS box to be placing your quotes. Um, whereas limit order books really require sophisticated liquidity providers. So different types of pairs with different levels of competitiveness. You know, do you need to be quoting less than one basis point wide to be able to win flow, or can you be quoting like one percent wide? I think the AMM versus the uh, limit order book differ a lot here. But the end game, I think, is probably going to look like a mix. The Specifically, the on-chain DeFi end game is going to look like a mix because the gas cost isn't zero. So the limit order book does have some, some issues here. There's like so much activity happening at the top of the book. Maybe you can reduce the number of transactions required to have close to optimal top of book liquidity. Um, the gas cost is always going to be positive, even if it is pretty close to zero. Push back a little bit there. So, uh, or maybe, maybe give a bit of an orthogonal take there. Uh, so generally, I think regardless of the underlying mechanics, there's kind of this core philosophical difference, or at least kind of the way we view it is that the core philosophy of AMMs is to make liquidity provision as simple and low barrier as possible. And I think, right, like the very, very classical, like XYK version of that is really simple, right? Like everyone's, everyone kind of deposits and then everyone participates, all, all the LPs participate together. So like kind of cooperative, um, even if there is a very sophisticated player, it's hard for them to kind of out earn somebody else. And uh, I would concentrate liquidity. It's a little more complicated, but I, I think that, right, that core philosophy still holds if liquidity is in range, everyone kind of participates at the same time. And with uh, order books, I think, right, like kind of the core philosophy there is always you need very, like they've always existed, you need specialized market makers who just do that and nothing else. So if you're not, if you're not one of the best kind of market making firms out there, right, you're probably not going to make any money in, uh, in order books. So uh, kind of a very different philosophy where two people providing liquidity in a book can have very, very different results based on based on their skill. And some of that does come from competition, which is good, but some of it also just comes from pure uh, rent seeking. Well, not rent seeking necessarily, but pure uh, winner take all games, like who's in the front of the queue, tends to be uh, very, very profitable regardless of, uh, you know, you're not actually improving the price. You're just competing to be the first order at, uh, at a new price. So generally like, I think even outside the mechanical or the gas constraints, the kind of the reason that we're AMM maxis is because uh, we think it's very powerful to have anyone kind of participate and be able to provide liquidity. Maybe to square the circle, I think between them, I would say I, I consider myself a compatibilist between between uh, central limit order books and AMMs. And you're at times having been in my life a rabid AMM maxi, I'd say I, I, I still try and I've maybe I've, I've sort of always tried not to be too, have too much religion about it. Um, and I think often the right, you know, you, you don't want to be uh, to sort of be blinded to to good arguments or to um, or to good compromises or an uh, implementation um, or good new features just because you think, oh, like this wouldn't be the AMM way to do things. Um, and I think that was certainly true with concentrated liquidity. And I think has been with a lot of the other of uh, the other changes that we've seen. Um, I think for, from my perspective, the core feature of what, may, what distinguishes AMMs from uh, central limit books probably is still the gas, um, gas and implementation. But I think it's actually, it's so overwhelming that I, I do think in most environments, in decentralized environments, often um, I think on-chain liquidity as an AMM is just always going to make sense um, or it's like to make sense more than central limit books, order books. And that's just because if there's any non-zero cost to placing and canceling an order, um, just orders in a, in a central limit order book are placed and canceled so often that it is just it's just much too expensive, I think, to be able to, to have transactions for every one of those. And I think the key feature to me of an AMM that actually makes it uh, a critical um, uh, a, a, a gas gas saving is that when orders are crossed, that I'll automatically uh, you flip the um, the liquidity that you, that you place a, a buy order after it's been crossed. And I think if you had a central limit order book that does that, you may be able to actually overcome a lot of these costs. But if you don't, then it's just going to be kind of overwhelming to have a 
um, a central limit order book with multiple liquidity providers, and it's and you're just never going to have that in a in a gas constrained environment. So that would roughly be my prediction. Is that I think I do believe it is it is primarily about gas, and I think you probably will still see professional uh, liquidity providers dominating um, on AMMs even um, in the long run, ultimately. But I think it it, it yeah, it ultimately is a very adaptive one for an environment like a blockchain. Hey everyone, wanted to take a quick second to shout out this season's partner, Maverick Protocol. Now, many of you probably know Maverick as an innovative AMM, which they are, but in reality, they're a lot more than that as well. Maverick is a suite of tools for DeFi users and builders that allows them to put liquidity where it will get the most work done. Since Maverick launched in March, they have been gobbling up market share and at the time of this recording, which is the end of September, on a trailing seven day volume basis, Maverick is now a top three DEX by volume and they support over 50% of the volume on the L2 ZK Sync era chain. Maverick enables LPs and token pairs to process higher volume with limited TVL, which allows them to support some of the highest levels of capital efficiency for LSTs like Rapsteeth. Another very cool feature is something called Maverick Boosted Positions. So that allows protocols looking to bootstrap their token liquidity to target the shape of liquidity of any token pair with surgical precision. Maverick is backed by some of the leading institutions in crypto, Founders Fund, Pantera, Coinbase Ventures, Finance Lab. They are all backing Maverick in their vision to revolutionize the next generation of DeFi dApps and helping them build their liquidity in all market conditions. Click the link at the bottom of this episode let them know that I sent you. Thanks, guys. Yeah, I'm curious. I don't know, Eugene, if you have a response there, but I think that that, that was a helpful squaring of the circle because I had been thinking about them as two relatively separate things of kind of this idea of retail passive versus very active professional liquidity. And I've sort of seen AMMs and central limit order books existing on a spectrum there with some of the more recent changes like UniB3 maybe looking more like an AMM, but like coming closer and closer to that um, maybe moving a little bit more to the midpoint in between AMM and central limit order book. And then obviously gas efficiency is, is a massive, a massive thing. So maybe, maybe we, we kind of attack those and, you know, Dan, I guess you just kind of, uh, ID that maybe gas is the most, most important thing there. So maybe Eugene, if you have any response to just the long-term efficacy of central limit order book, which is entirely on chain. And even if it's, you know, whatever the fee is on Solana these days, 0.00001 cents, if you're placing hundreds of you know, placing and canceling hundreds of thousands of bids on a daily basis, that does start to stack up. And then I do want to tease out the the second, maybe more minor part, uh, which is, you know, how realistic is it that we get sort of retail passive um, market makers, you know, who are able to, to profitably make, but maybe Eugene, if you want to respond to the, the gas cost thing. For sure. So we've seen um, with Uni V3, the AMM moving a little bit closer to what we conceptualize as a limit order book. Some of the stuff we're experimenting with internally at Ellipsis Labs is sort of going the other direction, starting from the pure limit order book implementation, which again is designed for a world that has literally zero uh, quote unquote gas cost, and figuring out how we can reduce the number of transactions required to place like effective top of book liquidity. And this sort of looks like programmable liquidity, different order types. Some that you could imagine would be, uh, as, as Dan mentioned, uh, orders that uh, when they get filled, they sort of flip to the other side uh, with some specified uh, spread that you want to take. You can also imagine orders that instead of you having to cancel them explicitly, they just like widen out on their own over time. Uh, you can also program in uh, specific liquidity curves. I think the design space here is super, super broad. And it definitely still is going to be wider in an environment where the your compute budget is just much less constrained like a Solana. Uh, of course, there's other trade-offs uh, here as well. But I definitely don't think that a pure naive limit order book implementation is going to be the like the end state for on-chain liquidity. This seems very unlikely to me. One question maybe just, uh, just to help level set for the audience and for me as well is, you know, when you're talking about designing and there, there's sort of a spectrum of, let's say, zero gas, which doesn't really exist today. And then there's a uh, very relatively cheap gas environment. So that'd be like a Solana. And then there's an environment which is extremely gas constrained, like Ethereum main chain, and then maybe roll up set even somewhere in between there. What is the mental framework for if, if gas is less expensive, does it just widen out the scope of what you can do? Is there just a much broader design space in, a, in an environment that's cheap in terms of gas? 
or is it sort of like a necessity is the mother of invention thing? And actually there are like, you have to be a little bit more creative, but you can do just about everything in a very gas constrained environment like ETH main chain that you could in even a very cheap environment. Well, I think the converse is definitely true that anything or pretty much anything you can do with DEX design on Ethereum that's viable there, you can just mindlessly port over to Solana, but the converse is just uh, not going to be true. For example, like you can't have an order book on Solana. You can't really have an efficient order book on Ethereum, uh, Ethereum mainnet. Is the design space just much more broad? So you can port things directly from Solana to ETH, maybe not the other way around. But you know, if I'm a, a dev and I'm sort of building on, on an Ambient or Uniswap, am I like, man, there's just like all this stuff that I would love to do in the world of Uniswap, but I just can't do it because of the gas constraints. Um, and maybe I know uh, Doug and Dan, you guys are both uh, like, for instance, like the singleton contract in Uniswap and Doug, I know Ambient you know, utilizes a, a single contract as well. Maybe that's an example of a way to get around some of these constraints. But I think we're just, I'm just trying to get a sense of like, is it, is there stuff that's just possible on Solana that's not possible anywhere else? Or that's what I'm trying to poke at here. Yeah. My impression is you can just do way more on Solana for like a given dollar of gas. You get so much more compute. The total throughput in terms of compute is significantly higher. Um, so the design space is just much more wide open. Well, I'd say it's also not just necessarily gas. The other the other constraint is block times. So um, if you have a 12 second block, that means you can't update your quotes for 12 seconds. And unfortunately, Binance doesn't freeze for, for 12 seconds. Um, which is challenging, right? And kind of requires different different considerations there. And then uh, the third thing, which is actually even true of Solana, which is not true of a, like a traditional centralized exchange is uh, the traditional centralized exchange, right? There's an order gateway and I send my order and it gets executed atomically in any blockchain, there's a block builder and that block builder has the ability to rearrange transactions. Now blocks can be shorter and they can rearrange transactions over smaller periods, but um, that's just like a fundamental issue with decentralized systems that, that even like Solana doesn't fix, right? Like th there's less of that on Solana because there's also just less of a market in general. But if you saw like 10 billion a day trading on Solana, yeah, you bet like there'd be block builders who start playing games with how they construct the block that create problems that don't exist in a centralized exchange. It's a problem with, with leaderful consensus protocols, but right to, to date, we basically only have those. So. Yes, in, th in theory, maybe there are other ways to do it, but <laughs> I'm actually curious about that. What, what, well, yeah, uh, well, what would be like an alternative? Well, there are there are uh, having people working on projects to try to do say batch auction dexes with uh, with threshold encryption. And Penumbra is one example uh, of a project mm. that does this. But um, the idea, and this, this is it's still leader, it's still uh, not leaderless consensus. So I, I maybe I take back that uh, as the. Uh, the qualifier here, but the key, the key idea being that if orders are encrypted and um, can't be decrypted except by the full group of the full validator set, um, and then they're confirmed before they actually get decrypted and then all executed and as, as a batch auction, then potentially you can avoid some of the MEV um, uh, that that might otherwise happen. And there are caveats to that, but I think there's there's designs that try to avoid this problem of having somebody who can see all the orders be responsible for order for. Um, arranging them all uh, mm. uh, within a block. So I think there are that some designs that you can do. Requires like major consensus level yes. changes. Yes. Okay. It's a, it's a, it would be a big change. Yeah. But it's a, the current okay. uh, uh, paradigm in both, in both um, Ethereum and Solana, I agree, has this, has this issue. I mean, how, how um, yeah, the, the block time thing is, is definitely something interesting as well. Maybe we can poke at this concept of latency, which has come up in a, uh, our earlier two episodes actually, which is just the role of latency just being very important for uh, for our deck. So Ethereum obviously has 12 second block times. Um, Solana has, I think Eugene is 400 milliseconds, give or take somewhere around there. Um, so can you just kind of like, just talk maybe at a high level about how you think about the role of block times and something Dan and I were actually talking about on the last episode is, you know, in an environment like Ethereum that has 12 second block times that just uh, prohibitive um, in some instances. Obviously, there is some price discovery occurring on sort of smaller pairs on on the likes of Uniswap or, or Ambient, but uh, just a little bit tougher from some of the more popular trading pairs where price discovery happens with uh, extremely on extremely low latency sexes like Binance. So, we'd just love to get your thoughts on sort of like how block time fits into the overall design decisions of a Dex and the role of latency as well. Yeah, um, I guess like a helpful 
thought exercise is like imagine block times were like a day or like 24 hours or whatever. Right. And I'm, I'm the block builder and I can go watch the price at like Binance and wherever the price of Binance, say it moves up or down like 1%. Um, so wherever the price of Binance goes, I will just uh, arbit for 1% and just, you know, do one trade, one big trade at, at the end of the day. Um, and the liquidity providers won't earn much fees off of that. Say the pool's I don't know, like five basis point fees. Uh, they won't earn much off of that. So um, not great for them. And say, say if we move down block times are one second or something where price moves about one basis point. Um, right. Like on average, they're going to do like 10,000 trades per day, right? They're still going to arrive at the same place, but they're going to do 10,000 trades, right? Because the price is going to move, kind of bounce around during that period. So some will be up, some will be down. Even at the end of 24 hours, it's up, right? They will arbitrageurs will have done a lot more executions and that's just better for liquidity providers, right? Cause that means they earn like cumulatively a lot more, a lot more fees over that period. And there's uh, theoretical results that, okay, if like the perfect Brownian motion and like block times go to zero, um, like our, all the arbitrage profits go to uh, liquidity providers. That's not really true because prices aren't Brownian motion. Like they jump discontinuously. So even if you have instant, block times, like there's still going to be kind of arbitrageurs who drain uh, capital from liquidity providers. But in general, um, as block times get shorter, uh, kind of it gets better for liquidity providers. We, we've done some research and like basically if you have like 100 millisecond block times, like in a hypothetical world, the LVR on like ETHUSDC would be, I don't know, over some period, like half as much as it is on a 12 second basis so it's pretty meaningful like at 12 seconds it's a pretty meaningful impact so basically the deal is just that overall the amount of arbitrage like move the price is roughly the same but if block block size or uh block times are smaller then just more trading happens so it ends up being beneficial for lps who get to collect those trading fees and offset some of that lever yeah the, the block builder is basically like the dictator for the block time. So very big block or very long blocks mean a very powerful dictator who can kind of abuse the system more than a very short lived dictator. Hmm. Yep. So on these like L1s like Ethereum and Solana to like the, the first order thing to do to reduce the LVR is to reduce the, the block times. Uh, but there's also these worlds where we have the benevolent block builder, like the all of the L2s today with the single sequencer most of them uh, roughly just order transactions in the order they receive them. And so that looks a little bit closer to the, to the centralized exchange world um, where there's going to be significantly less uh, LBR. Doug, I, I want to get back to something you said in, um, uh, when you're introducing the topic that you think the key uh, feature of AMMs is that they allow for passive liquidity provision. I mean, that's, that's independent of gas, right? So yeah, I think were, even, yeah. sorry. Uh, yeah. Even, yeah. Even independent of yeah. gas. I think that's so, true. so if you were in, uh, developing and, you know, I suppose ETH solves all its scaling problems and now <laughs> gas is, is, uh, near free and, um, uh, and latency is half a second. Um, do you think you'd still be building AMMs? Yeah, I, I think so actually. I mean, and like, you can see this on the like long tail of tokens, it becomes very obvious, right? Like, Market makers, professional traders have a very high cost of capital. Um, and so, right, like at the end of the day, like Jane Street and Citadel and whoever don't really want to be holding Harry Potter, Obama, Sonic Inu uh, on their portfolio. So, right, to provide liquidity on it, they're going to uh, demand a very high return on capital. And, and market makers do make a very high return on capital. So I think there is an economic uh, argument to be made that retail providers, especially to the extent they're already holding these assets to begin with, have a much lower cost of capital to provide uh, liquidity. And like, I, I, that's very obvious on long tail of tokens, right? Where the cost to hold uh, like some very long tail shit coin is, is really high and like no market maker like wants to get involved in that to begin with. So you need AMM. But I, I think if you can fix the economics, if you can fix the mechanism, then there's potentially a world where passive liquidity because of its cost of capital advantage can actually outcompete uh, active liquidity. So there's ways to circumvent this, right? Like I agree the hurdle rate on capital is gonna be much higher for sophisticated market makers than it is for retail. 
But you can have another model where retail sort of just lends to the market makers rather than going through the perfect market design rigmarole. And you still just let the, the best liquidity providers be the one who are providing liquidity. And if retail is happy, say, making 10% on their capital and the market maker is going to make 20% or 50%, uh, there's, there's a trade to be made there on the, on the lending side. Do you, I mean, do you think there's some benefit to not having uh, the lenders have to trust the market maker? It, it has been known to happen that people who lend to market makers in the crypto industry um, have, have lost money. <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, there's ways to do it on chain, right? You can build a mechanism here. I don't think it's too complicated where you integrate uh, a lending or a margin engine into the, into the, uh, the exchange itself. And, and that sorry, can be so, done in a totally transparent way, unlike uh, I think some of the examples you're referencing. And so what you're saying is you, you have a market maker that's that's somehow constrained so that they're not actually they're able to use uh, lender capital, but limited in how they're able to use it. Yeah, like they can only use it to place orders on the book and you have like a pretty standard liquidation mechanism there. Well, I mean, I guess uh, that maybe dovetails into something else is that like the nice part about X, Y, K curves are like your losses are bounded, right? Like you can not charge the right fees, you can hit with LBR, but like you can't lose all your money versus if you have like a rogue market making algorithm like night, right? Like for example, 2012, like lost 600 million. So like XYK or like, I mean, XYK, like concentrated liquidity has like very, very nice properties and um, around like bounding losses and uh, separating out capital from like fees earn. That's also kind of a very nice property that you can use in other ways. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think there's a lot of really nice properties that come out of I, I agree. I think this, this is something we talked about with um, with Alex Neslobin last week. Um, but then I, I think if you if you did build in a, a protocol like this for lending to market makers, and then they can you know they can market make with your capital, but um, only you know preserving some amount of path to pa independence for your losses. I think you will actually end up with basically an AMM. There's an AMM where the um, uh, uh, where some opt-in agents uh, chooses fees, which is sort of similar to the design we were discussing with Alex. Again, and this, this is part of my my compatibilist. You know, we're all actually just working on the same spectrum with multiple, and multiple, or and are playing with different things on different on different uh, levels with these features, rather than um, there really being one like core dichotomy between AMMs and, and central limit order books here. I mean, I guess the other part, like maybe this is like ideological, but like it's nice for decentralized markets not to be dependent on like a small handful of trading firms and like the reality is like that kind of did happen with Solana after FTX collapsed is like liquidity disappeared for a lot of things because those protocols were dependent on very, very centralized entities. Obviously that doesn't mean right. Like clubs can still compete. People are going to use like whatever's cheapest, but like, I think it's nice to have passive liquidity from like just an ecosystem perspective. I think it's definitely nice to enable it. Uh, but realistically speaking, it's probably going to like, probably the most sophisticated liquidity providers are going to be the ones who make the most money. And there's some economic forces there for sure. I, I guess that's just a, cause Doug, I don't think anyone on this call would argue from an ideological standpoint that, you know, it'd be a great world, right? If like anyone who's just retail person could passively provide liquidity in such a way that they earned a return. But, um, you know, my understanding of market making is that it's actually, a very difficult, highly competitive task, um, and even some of the best well, in the world. <laughs> yes, but is it difficult because the market makers are doing very, very well for the end customers, or is it difficult because it's a winner-take-all game um, where they have to outcompete each other? Right. Like if you were the only market maker on Microsoft. It probably would not be that like no one else was allowed to provide liquidity on market Microsoft. You were the market, but probably would not be that difficult to make money, right? You have competitors, right? Like maybe things get tighter, but like market makers also compete in other ways that don't provide anything for the end user. So they, I mean, they're entire trading firms that do nothing, but I'm just always first at the queue. Like I have no signals. I don't price improve. It's just price changes. I'm the first order, right? I have the FPGAs. I'm the fastest. So like, like it is difficult uh, in that sense, but the question is like, how much of that difficulty is because they're doing really, really well for end users, and I think that's kind of ambiguous. You might have a point there. I, I think it's a different. I think it's a difficult question that industries where there are maybe natural monopolies really struggle. Like um, utility providers would be a good example of this, or frankly, even like the. 
the Lido debate that's playing out in Ethereum is probably a good example where there are, uh, there's a market where there's a, a natural winner take all or winner take most market structure. And then obviously no one really wants to end with a monopoly. So what ends up happening is some form of regulation or whatever. Um, and then theoretically, that's supposed to mitigate the negative effects of a natural uh, winner take all or winner take most market structure. But um, yeah, I guess I, I I agree that that's not a particularly good outcome either. Although I will say like, uh, I mean, I guess the way that you would measure this is right on execution quality. And if we had to, you know, be honest about the execution quality for on-chain swappers in Ethereum to date, it's like, okay, sort of at, at best. So, you know, do you think that if there were more professional liquidity providers that there would be better execution for swappers on chain or is there another constraint that's preventing that? Well, I mean, I think the the biggest constraint is just like going back it's the block like I'm happy to provide liquidity at Binance if I'm a very fast firm because I can move my quotes around, but um I can't eat, right like I, I think sometimes people conflate clubs versus uh just having centralized systems where you don't have this block builder issue. Um, so, right, like clubs don't fix this problem, right? There's still going to be LVR, there's going to be sex dex arbitrage, mm -hmm. and whether I'm an LP and an AMM or whether I'm a market maker on a club, uh, the guy who's building the block can hit my quotes before before I can move them. So, uh, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's tough to say. This is one of my pet peeves is when people think that putting a limit order book on chain rather than off chain for example, is like, oh, like that's a solution to MEV. And it's like, no, that, that's that's the cause of MEV. That's exactly, <laughs> that's exactly like the, at the heart of what, what will cause MEV. And I worry that it actually puts more essentially on the, um, on block build. It puts more into the, more problems into the core of the protocol, right? Whereas if you have an off-chain limit order book, maybe you sort of, you handle those in the application layer and you have MEV maybe at the application layer, however you're ordering them um, or canceling them. But I think if you're putting that into the block, then you're, you're uh, incentivizing um, basically, the core protocol actors to get a little more involved in the application layer, and you're 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 sort of putting more pressure on that core mechanism. Yeah, so I'm I'm, I'm curious, Eugene. Like, I mean, with an, with an on-chain um, uh, central limit order book, aren't you worried that that might just lead to pressure on Solana validators to to get more sophisticated in extracting MEV? Oh yeah, absolutely. I think it's a a huge potential problem for the future, and I think the main reason we don't see it today is because there's just not that much value to be extracted. Combined with, uh, I guess, um, uh, modifying the Solana validator client is uh, a, pr a pretty expensive endeavor. Can we play with this a little bit then? Because let's let's maybe take the extreme here and then say actually moving some of this activity on chain would not be beneficial from a MEV standpoint. Obviously, builder centralization is a concern as well. Um, and, and maybe one of the, the recent trends also in the world of uh, DEXs is moving some of the components of a DEX off chain. Uh, so maybe we can sort of segment like Uniswap X would be a good example of this. Um, and I, I would be curious, maybe Doug, I, I can pick on you as our as our ideological champion in, in the discussion thus far. Um, I mean, I guess the, the benefit that you might say there is by moving things off chain, in a sense, you actually do protect users um, and you their orders are kept more private. But on, on, on the other hand, you can make the argument that and then, then what are we really doing here, right? If there's just, uh, there's probably a relatively limited uh, builder or solver market that takes these off-chain orders. And then if it's not on-chain, then what are we really doing? So how do you approach the the idea of moving uh, certain components of, of the DEX stack off-chain? Like one major, major advantage uh, that really hasn't been tapped now that uh, on-chain systems have relative to off-chain systems is that you can... Uh, introspect, kind of like I guess not introspect. Look into like where the order flow is coming from to like a much finer degree. Right, like someone sends an order to Binance, it's right like very hard to like okay, what's generating that order? So like, for example, like most LVR uh, at the end of the day is really just coming from short term dislocations on the price at Binance, and somebody's arbitraging it, so they're very very time time sensitive, right? So like, it would be easy to put something on chain to say okay like hypothetically, right, this is a, this is a TWAP order. Um, because as a TWAP order, we know it's much, much less toxic. So we can like, it can get a much better price, right? Like, and it's hard to, you know, it's going through a TWAP smart contract or, or whatever. Um, right, that's like very hard to do at a centralized exchange, right? Because like, you can't just do, put smart contracts into a centralized exchange. So I think that's 
kind of the winning approach. And I think that's how on-chain systems actually beat out off-chain systems uh, in the long term. It's easier said than done, obviously. Uh, in terms of moving stuff off-chain, we're very bullish on like coprocessors. And we think right, like the technology is getting pretty mature where you can start doing compute not on chain, but, but doing it in some sort of like trust, semi trustless way, uh, you know, making some, some attestation about maybe, okay, this address has like, hasn't been sending toxic flow over the past month or whatever. Um, so it should get preferential, uh, better execution. Um, so right. I think that kind of solves the problem where, okay, like there's stuff we just can't do on chain or it's very difficult to do on chain, but like anyone can run the coprocessor, uh, or you can build like ZK proofs, you can. So it's like still keeps that aspect of decentralization. But, you know, it's definitely definitely not a solved problem uh, for what we're building. I think in general, a lot of nuance kind of gets lost when we use the word decentralized because there's so many layers of the stack. There's, uh, and, and, you know, at least in my view, decentralization really is a means to an end. Uh, when I think about what is the end goal for DeFi, it's to move finance on chain and the reason we want to do that is so we can have permissionless innovation in finance we can have open access we can have transparency now of course bringing things on chain we eat this massive um cost in terms of uh, performance we have like mev considerations and whatnot and we need to build DeFi in a way that is competitive with centralized exchanges and I think uh, the permissionless innovation piece, or as Doug says, uh, sort of like putting smart contracts everywhere, which we can't really do on a centralized exchange today. I agree that's uh, the biggest place to compete. Now, when I think about uh, a Uniswap X or some of these other off-chain RFQs, I do worry that it attacks the on-chain liquidity a little bit too much. So first of all, uh, we're going to be moving liquidity and moving uh, price discovery off chain. I think it is going to result in better outcomes for swappers, which is necessary to be competitive with centralized exchanges. But the system itself also loses some degree of censorship resistance and transparency and uh, uh, permissionless access. And then you can end up in some sort of death spiral where because the LP has now become the liquidity of last resort, they end up eating pretty much only toxic flow, right? Like the flow that the the RFQ market maker didn't want to get. And uh, yeah, that in itself seems pretty centralizing where the order flow itself becomes centralized. The RFQ likely has to be permissioned or somewhat permissioned for, for, uh, for quite a while. And some of that I feel like is antithetical to uh, you know, permissionless innovation, open access, and transparency. I think this might be an area where both our guests agree um, <laughs> you know, each other more than they, than they do with me. But I think <laughs> maybe to make the the case on this, I think I think we already have a lot of price discovery, um, including indexes and including on AMMs, happening off chain. Um, and I think the key the key reason to move to an to an intent based architecture, move toward an intent based architecture, is to be able to actually incorporate. A lot more of that information, I think, into the price discovery process, including potentially for to protect LPs and protect Xs on chain. And I think what Doug was talking about before about reflecting, for example, information about where an order came from um, or who or who a buyer is. I think that's a lot easier to do with an off chain when you have more off chain components and when you have an intent based system. Um, and that potentially, I think, can be used to to potentially help help protect LPs from from toxic flow and to and to help discriminate against flow. And I think I think. Um, uh, 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 Fedboy and, and Doug have written a lot about this as well. Um, I think I think that's it's it's potentially essential for protecting LPs. But yes, I would also say, in, from my perspective, the most important thing is to be able to get swappers the best price. And if you don't, if you're not getting swappers the best price, certainly the best price you can get on chain. But in general, I think to be competitive with someone like Binance, you're just not going to have a, any um, uh, decks to protect anymore. You're going to basically lose everybody. Will it will it give them the best price? Like it gives them both the best price. Like once you turn on RFQs and you still have LP liquidity, because the RFQs can only price improve. But like long term for the ecosystem, if the LPs leave, do they still get the best price, or now the RFQs can just widen out? Well, I think what matters long term is that 
Um, I think both sides, you can't actually cannibalize either side because then you, you'll just basically eventually lose it. So I think ultimately you actually need to find your equilibrium. But my argument is that an intent-based architecture like Uniswap X potentially actually protects um, liquidity providers more because you actually can, can encode into that more information about where the order comes from. And I think a lot of, a lot of what we've seen just in sort of next generation designs for, for DEXs, I think, have to incorporate to some extent uh, more information about the swapper um, and more information potentially coming from off chain. That's what I think right. I, yeah, go ahead. But, 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 uh, right, like in the existing architecture, right? Like, what's to stop the RFQs from just, right? Like, you can incorporate it, but like, if you have an RFQ system, can the RFQ provider, right? Like, the RFQ provider can just centrally compute. Yeah. I'm, I'm, and, yeah. yeah. And I, I'm not, I'm not trying to defend the uh, uh, RFQ systems. And in fact, I think, again, there are better, there are better intent based architectures and, and ones that I think use that is kind of designed. Like, the use of X core protocol is not an RFQ protocol, right? Uh, um, okay. It's a, it's an order for, for off chain signed intent protocol for signing, for signing these orders, right? And RFQs right now are how the initial prices are set. But in my view, that's not essential to, to what, to what really matters about Uniswap X. I have a thought too. I mean, is part of this like you start to see? Obviously, it's very early days for frameworks like Anoma, but um, I mean, is, is part of the reason here why that that some of this just isn't actually built out, and some of the stuff that feels like an off-chain RFQ system might actually eventually be able to be completely replicated in an on-chain sense? We just aren't there with the technology yet. Well, one idea I think uh, on-chain is tough especially in a design, in a system that works like uh, uh, Ethereum or Solana work currently, where you have a, a, a dictatorial builder um, or dictatorial proposer, sorry, about for a particular uh, period of time. I do think a decentralized uh, RFQ system could be a very interesting system. And, and that's something that I think, um, I think it's early days on this, but something like Suave that Flashbots is, build, is, is uh, working on. I think one of the problems they want to try to solve with that is, could we actually build a decentralized off-chain RFQ system, uh, an auction? Hmm. How, how would that, how would you assure priority for whoever's offering the best execution? So if you have a, if you have a consensus, pro and this is not, I'm not describing the here specifically, but just yeah, yeah, yeah. just, idea. just in like the yeah. general theory. The general idea is it's, it should be easier to do a, as soon as we have a decentralized protocol where we want to guarantee just, uh, just censorship resistance, but say not we, don't care as much about ordering, we'll have that all solved at the execution layer. The idea would be you have some like validator set and then you say, okay, we need two thirds of validators to sign off on this on this set. And they say the rule of the protocol is they only will if they've if um, it includes the best order that they've seen, right? And as a result, you could then have like, you know, a, a large, it's basically a large multi-sig effectively of, uh, of validators that are then running this auction. And they, this by the way is part of how people think about, um, designs for like enshrining MEV in the, in the Ethereum protocol as well. But I think there's other ways to do it. If they were say, to run this auction, then you potentially could have a censorship resistant auction that, that finds the best price off chain um, with a decentralized group, but doesn't have all the costs of, of um, on chain compute. You don't actually have to include all the bad bits. You only have this, this group come to consensus on the winner, but you still- It would be like a bad majority. batch auction. It would, well, I'm, I hear I'm just thinking about a regular auction, but one where just the best bit is actually included, ends up getting included by the, um, uh, because just all the validators just apply this particular rule to blocks. Hmm. Anyway, it's uh, I, I don't mean to, to drive us too far down this rabbit hole, but my point is if you're if you're trying to design an off-chain system to run a decent a normal it's an auction, right? Like, it's a more limited uh, problem than trying than like the whole problem of trying to to put like uh, run a, a, a blockchain a synchronous blockchain, right? So a censorship resistant auction and a like synchronous blockchain solve two different problems, and I think there's there's a reason maybe not to try to jam the former one into this into the latter. Yeah, so it's like you want Ethereum, which is very secure consensus for settlement, and then you have yeah. some sort of parallel consensus for secure execution. and like Turing complete and fully composable. Whereas for this, yeah. all we actually need is a is a, it's a different property that we need, which is just short term censorship resistance. Okay, is that I mean, is that like related to Pepsi? Basically, is that something that Pepsi would enable? I am not sure. I've seen what's what's Pepsi. Pepsi is uh, <laughs> Pepsi We're is Barnaby. Like, they probably pitched us <laughs> or something. I'm, I'm right now. Uh, but it's but it's it's not something that's actually implemented. But it, Barnabé from the Ethereum Foundation, it stands for Protocol Enforced Proposer Commitments, and it would allow think of it sort of like a souped up version of something like inclusion lists, where ahead of time a proposer could make certain commitments, and one of those commitments could be like I'm going to commit to. Uh, 
even potentially using one builder or one system like a decentralized RFQ system or, or decentralized builder like a swap. Or maybe they could say like, I'm going to commit to choosing the highest, um, you know, the highest bid that I get uh, for a user or something like that. You could you could actually sort of, in, you know, build that into actually the Ethereum consensus. So it's like one yes. flavor of... Uh, sorry. Well, yes, I mean, you... you oh, sorry, go ahead, Dan. Go ahead. No, no. I was going to say, you could even do that on the application layer because your intent, you could say, okay, I only want, my transaction's only executable under if this builder is the one building the block, right? So like there's a hypothetical world where there's a, I wish it was an ambient builder, but Uniswap's the one with the market share. But there's a Uniswap builder and all Uniswap order flow goes through, or Uniswap affiliated builders all go through these builders and in order to participate, you have to have. Um, yes, but 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 I I wouldn't try to jam it too much again. I think into the protocol there because I think say like why why bother with who who the Ethereum builder is at all? Like why not just say it needs to be signed off by some by a sequencer effectively, right? Like hmm. my order would need to, all everyone everyone trading on this dex needs to sign off. I don't know. There's there's, there's a whole space of, of well, you could uh, just do that instead of separate Ethereum transactions. Just everyone submits call data and one yeah. person submits one giant transaction with the call data all and in they're, a they're single the, payload, and then the yeah, application exactly. processes. Yeah. Yeah, so I have like have an application specific builder basically, and my my general point is I think just the all this requires effectively I think getting a little bit out of the Ethereum transaction um, modality out of that paradigm where where you have to everything every order like has to be an Ethereum transaction or you can just like call this thing from any um, in any Ethereum transaction and get a little more into like okay like we're working with intents it's a little more flexible and we can do a little more at the application layer, and in my view that's like the spirit of Uniswap X. Yeah. Um, I, I want to end, guys, by maybe trying to give a give listeners a sense of what how you see the end game for for Dex design. So the, just to put together some of the points, because it's still a little bit murky for for me. So you know, Eugene, I heard you say that we're probably not going to one to one copy pasta a central limit order book, which is the dominant design for exchanges in TradFi onto crypto. So that's not necessarily going to work. At the same time, you know, I think the hope is that we still have retail passive liquidity and LPing well into the future, but maybe, you know, it's safer to assume a more professional active base of LPs, even within our AMMs. So I, I would just love to get a sense of like how more concretely we see all of this shaking out. And then I know everyone on this call is actually a big fan of hooks and the design <laughs> space that, that that opens up as well. So I would love to understand how like that innovation sort of enables maybe something that's just totally net new in terms of Dex design that we haven't even seen in TradFi. Yeah, I can answer the second question first. Um, I think hooks are a very, very interesting model and definitely opened up the design space. Uh, you're going to have just, first of all, much more, much more of like an open market where the barrier to entry to uh, like creating a new DEX design is a lot lower because you sort of just have to implement uh, an interface as opposed to implementing the entirety of the DEX itself. I think today it sort of seems like most hook-based models are going to be like anchored on either an AMM like Uniswap v4 is or on a limit order book. Again, that's something we've been thinking about for quite some time at Ellipsis Labs. My mental model here is you have um, basically programmable liquidity, whether that's at the pool-based level or at the, the order-based level. Some of the stuff uh, we were chatting about earlier on uh, code processors and whatnot, you can imagine if the computations are super simple, those could even just live on-chain as well. Like some of this um, um, just-in-time flow discrimination could just live at the, at the order level itself. Uh, I think the design space is super open here. And there's also a lot of really, really thorny questions that are going to be difficult to answer. Uh, for example, like gas griefing, compute griefing, uh, the, I think the security space opens up quite a bit as well. Um, but the design space is super wide open. Um, and I'm definitely very interested to see uh, what the Uniswap hooks community is cooking up. So yeah, um, no, that makes sense. I think in general, right, like you kind of need hooks for, um, or, or something similar to it for uh, right, like actually building uh, more complex models where um, passive liquidity can compete with, you know, ob obviously, right, like if I'm a liquidity provider uh, at NASDAQ, I'm running very, very sophisticated, like quoters, 
to, um, to provide liquidity. Like th theoretically, imagine you could just run um, the best high frequency trader quoter inside a hook. That'd be that'd be pretty cool. Um, so I think like the biggest low hanging fruit for AMMs right now is like the price of liquidity or the fee model has been very very simple. Like pretty much just uh, pretty much just a flat fee per pool. Uh, like some simple models, but uh, you can get really complex with um, either changing things based on market conditions or um, even more interesting where the order flow is coming from. And, and like, we've talked about that a lot and that that's really hard to do um, without, without hooks. And, and kind of the cool part is right. Like hooks, you have this core AMM system, which can be rock solid uh, secure and like kind of the properties we talked about before. And then you can have this separate system that can be much more on the cutting edge about like setting, setting fees and the price price of liquidity, which is where you really need kind of the innovation. Basically. And then here we really have a clear argument for why we can expect on-chain DEXs to outperform the centralized exchanges where you really have this uh, permissionless innovation. I think that's really the key here. I hadn't thought about this way before. Like one way to think about hooks maybe is in sort of building up that metaphor is that it's like co-location um, in the context of, of <laughs> yeah. H50s is that you can like basically just ship your algorithm off to the to the chain and just have that run before every trade. Um, and then, yeah, you're, you're running like, you know, faster than the speed of light in some sense because nobody can actually um, uh, compete. And again, obviously, obviously there's, still, there's still the block time to consider and I think the limited, the limited information available on chain. But I think in some sense, having your algorithm co-located with the chain potentially could help you, could help you in ways that there's just no way for a, um, uh, like an off-chain market maker to compete. Yeah, even better. I mean, even not, yeah, in, inside the matching engine. Itself. Yeah, exactly. Um, right. <laughs> new narrative. <laughs> I don't. I don't know if that one will. That one will uh, uh, catch on much. Like people, people, don't, people don't love co-location. Yeah, the, the, <laughs> the people half the people appreciate it in this podcast. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, um, you know, I, not to go too far down this rabbit hole, but I do think now that people have heard Michael Lewis's takes on SBF, maybe they're reevaluating how harsh they really should be on HFT <laughs> as a <laughs> as a community. There is this hilarious footnote in the book where, where he's like, but J you know, Jane Street's one of the good HFTs. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Anyway. Super funny. I know we're we're starting to wind down on on time here. So maybe just um if I could ask you to put on your your visionary caps here a little bit and just ask how you see things playing out in in broader terms, just in terms of maybe even something as high level as market structure. So the mix between let's just focus on the on-chain world of AMMs versus central limit order books moving forward. Obviously, maybe a little bit of that depends on the growth of Ethereum versus uh, a lot Solana or other high high TPS blockchains as ecosystems. Um, and then I, I actually want to close on like we're starting to get into it a little bit with with hooks, but what excites me about that is an actual, you know, sort of something that's possible to do in a non-chain environment or with a DEX that you just can't, it doesn't feel like a compromise to a centralized exchange. You're just doing it because we all share these values, but something that would actually be, you know, that's actually a net new innovation, which feels really cool. So I would love to, uh, whoever wants to kind of take it, like, how do you feel, view things shaking out from sort of a market share perspective? And then, you know, are hooks the way that are hooks the hook to bring to bring price discovery on chain more or like how do you see that happening i think in the next couple of years the most clear trends to me are one the amm and the on-chain amm and the on-chain order book models are going to continue to converge to some degree and the second is uh, especially on the ethereum side with all of its l2s uh, i expect to see much more fragmentation of liquidity which could also potentially push things, uh, push more of the price discovery off chain where you end up with, uh, for example, market maker based uh, bridges rather than tapping into the on chain liquidity itself. That's an interesting point. I'm probably broadly aligned with that. Um, I actually, yeah, I, I think rollups are very interesting, but I think a lot of things that are being done in rollups now can be done in co processors. So, uh, I'm still kind of bullish that there's going to be a lot of, I, I don't think we're going to live in a world where all activity moves to roll up. So I think there's kind of demand for mainnet liquidity and, and people want to transact on mainnet, even though a lot of people will transact on, on roll ups um, as well. But, but I think, um, you know, I think AMMs will get a lot more sophisticated about accurately pricing liquidity and, um, 
think they'll take market share. You know, they still have a long, long way to compete with finance to close that gap, but um, kind of the innovation at like consensus or like MEV or like block builder layer is uh, a lot of really interesting things. So if, if there's a chance for on-chain world to overtake Binance, I think it's in the next few years. That's an interesting take, Dirk. Could you, uh, maybe just to poke at that a little, like why do you think people won't migrate to rollups as much? Is it a security concern a little bit? I think the security is fine. I just think um, right now, like if I need cheap compute, kind of the only way I can do that is on a rollup in, in like the Ethereum world. Um, but with coprocessors, um, you can get much cheaper in, in some contexts, right? So where you still have to do a transaction, you have all that, but you can do a lot of very heavy compute um, off chain and, you know, only post a proof. And that's, that's fairly simple to verify. So, so roll up's almost like a coprocessor, but like a very, very like general purpose, like large coprocessor that's running a full version of the chain. And I think what we'll see are much smaller coprocessors that just do one thing. Um, like just price the liquidity based on, you know, whatever the, the history, the market conditions, um, or, you know, other things in lending protocols and outside DEXs as well. Um, and so, right. Like some of that, so, some things that would previously have to go on a roll up because it needed very cheap compute, we'll be able to offload some of that compute and operate on mainnet. Eugene and Doug, thank you both so, so much for coming on the show. If folks want to find out more about ambient finance or ellipsis or, or just follow the two of you um what's the best way what's the best way to do that yeah you can follow me on twitter i'm at zero x shit trader and you can follow ellipsis labs at at ellipsis underscore labs visit our application at ambient.finance uh follow us at at ambient underscore finance or follow me at zero x doug i feel like i've given you the shout out many times doug but the uh the croc swap blog I think it's still a crock swap, <laughs> right? But that still uh, the, we well, the wealth of information. If if anyone wants to seriously nerd out on uh, dexes, and there's some great <laughs> empirical uh, studies and, and writing on there, so definitely check that out too. All right, guys, thanks. This has been a super fun episode. I appreciate you both coming on, Dan. Great, great episode there. Um, it's it's really unique to you. It was it was cool that we got sort of the Solana and Central Limit Order Book perspective, and then we had a more classical AMM designer in the form of Doug. So yeah, absolutely. Where where I want to start, and one thing that that stood out to me and you kind of, you kind of actually gave your opinion there a little bit at the top of the episode, but I'd actually like to turn it over to you. Cause I'm sure you've thought about this quite a bit, but where we, where we shied away from a little, maybe everyone was being a little, a tad too polite actually on the episode, but in terms of like more concretely, how you think about market structure playing out, uh, even between a central limit order book and an, and an AMM, because, you know, to be, maybe to take the, the steel man case for both. Sometimes I, I feel like I often hear this more from professional traders who are more accustomed to sexes, but, you know, it used to be very popular and I'm starting to see it even more now. It's like central limit order book is the ultimate design, right? Like this is where we're heading towards. And, and AMMs, like they're cute for now while we were, we're worrying about gas and with all these other constraints, but this just doesn't make much sense. Heard something very different um, on, on this episode, which I heard you say, like, I just don't really see a central limit order book because as soon as there's any cost, the traditional making uh, market making models is not really going to play out. Um, probably there's a little bit of a place for both, but like if you had to, you know, guess at the market structure of the next like five years, how do you really see it playing out? Yeah. So I think there are two really important spectra here. Um, both of which we touched on some in the art in the article. Um, so one is about, uh, just the design space for, um, markets in different environments. Mm. And I think one important thing, and this is something that I, you know, I used to be a rad, like a pretty radical pro AMM, you know, anti central limit order book uh, uh, person, at least on Twitter. And I think, especially with the development of Uniswap v3, I modulated on that a lot in part because I think, oh, actually, we can keep a lot of the benefits that AMMs have, but don't, but we don't actually have to tie in this whole bundle that we thought was attached to, to AMMs. Um, but we can still do it in a way where this thing is is uniquely d suited for the environment, right? There's sort of a, a fitness for survival in this particular environment. Um, that AMMs have on, on blockchains. And, uh, you know, I think then there's there's a uh, sect that I would argue with a lot back then, but still do, of people who say, no, like central limit order books, order books are just the, the teleology, the end state of um, how markets should work. And yeah, I, I, think, I think that's wrong even in traditional markets. In fact, like a lot of assets are actually not traded on central limit order books, right? Like mm -hmm. options typically are, are, are more often um, 
uh, traded traded with with RFQs or with or over the counter or, or in, other, in other ways. You know, like it's typically it's not you know, and real estate is not traded in central limited order books for um, uh, maybe obvious reasons. But like a lot of different of uh, uh, markets, just because of differences in the assets, differences in the participants, Treasuries. In what people want. Treasury is absolutely not not traded on a central limited order book. Um, a lot of a lot of different assets get traded in different ways that that correspond to their, those characteristics and the people who are who are trading them, and I think central limit order books are they're popular for for a certain kind, for a certain set of equities. Um, that's like the dominant form of uh, of uh, exchange, but it's not like the universal way that we should trade any everything. And so I think people who come in and say, oh, ev- obviously crypto should should be uh, traded on central limit order books. Um, and AMMs are just like a like a temporary stopgap before we hit that end state. I think are actually being ahistorical, a- even even with respect to how um, uh, markets work elsewhere. And so yeah, so I, but I think you know the idea of framing this as AMMs versus central limit order books. I do think it's interesting because both of them had a lot of very nuanced takes on this. In part because you know they're practical. They're building these things for this environment. They kind of know oh you have to make this compromise here and this different one here. Um, and really, I think what what you see with both of them is okay. They're they're adapted to the environment that they've been that they've been building for. Um, and they, I think they recognize that. So I think that's that's important is rather than being kind of religious about anything. And I, I'll admit I used to have more religion, I think, about this where I was like, oh, eventually, you know, the S&P is going to all be traded on AMMs. And I, I, I'd say I don't think that anymore. Um, but I think similarly, I don't think it's it's at all obvious that that um, all markets will eventually converge on on. Um, some particular, at least central limit order book design. The other thing that I think this touches on, and Doug talked about it a bit, is that there's a, there's a uh, related but separate distinction between passive and active liquidity. And I think um, it is important for Doug, I think, uh, and for and for many people, and and to some extent for for me, that uh, passive that it, it be possible for uh, ordinary people to be able to provide liquidity um, uh, on a you know on on market on markets. In some like fair fairly, in some sense that they can they can do it kind of alongside professionals. They won't be outcompeted by professionals, or maybe that they'll be able to make um, to still make uh, money from it. I think it's. I think I'd say it's. I mean, he made some good points. I think it's certainly uh, very useful for a long for a long tail of assets. Um, but I think you know that that's a view that, and certainly another one that I had, maybe even more strongly. And this was important, but um, I would say I think. Eugene made some good points, and I and I would um, uh, say I think it's one of the goals as we've talked about that is maybe worth sacrificing potentially for for other purposes in order to make sure that that uh, non custodial exchange wins, for example, um, or that swappers get the best possible price. Um, and it's one where I think we I'm not as sure that we will end up with a long term future where on um, especially like you know the most liquid pairs, it's where it's going to make sense that you have a, a, a amateurs providing liquidity. Yeah, I've thought about this a lot, and I, I think no one would be on the side that, that ideologically that wouldn't be wouldn't be a great outcome. Um, I do wonder how much it. I've been wondering more and more how much it makes sense, and maybe to just. I, I really like how we actually started almost chronologically. Like, why do AMMs exist? Because of this constraint in the form of gas. But the the other constraint that we didn't necessarily talk about, and I know you've discussed this as well with some products that required arbitrageurs to come in and prick up free money. Today, we can safely assume that. We couldn't always assume that. There, there probably was a period of time where market making on chain, I mean, that was very bizarre. I don't think it was a very safe assumption to say that professionals would come in and do that. And you probably needed to rely on a more retail base. And because it's crypto and because we are religious about everything, as soon as it works for the <laughs> the retail person, this is now some some God-given right and ordained from on high. And That's right. I'm not 100% sure about that. And I think it, it almost maybe even applies to the to the longer tail where you actually do have, for example, like J- Jared from Subway.eth is an infamous example here, but you actually do have um, uh, arbitrageurs and, you know, MEV extractors that are, that are taking like, you know, Delta risk. They're actually, they're actually mark, effectively market making <clears throat> some of these long tail tokens. Um, and they're like, yeah, they're going out and finding these and, and market making them effectively, taking taking exposure to mm. uh, these tokens. And this is why I think uh, the best theory I've heard for why, uh, and this was from Robert Miller, for why Jared from Subway be, became could be profitable as a uh, uh, so profitable as a map searcher is he was willing to take risks that um, that other market makers weren't. Um, but yeah, he, he's functionally acting like a market maker, you know, and, and, uh, sort of a, a very a, a strange one. Um, but in some ways, in some ways, uh, playing some part of the, part of that role, and I think we would see potentially, even in the longer term, maybe um, more uh, more MEV searchers and, and arbitrageurs, more sophisticated parties making markets in these long tail tokens on chain. 
Um, I think the fact that token sniping, um, uh, basically buying up a lot of liquidity uh, that at the moment a token is launched um, has become this this niche area of MEV extraction. Um, if you do that, you're 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 going to end up taking on a risk that you might not be able to sell those tokens. Um, and so, like it, it actually does. It requires a somewhat more sophisticated party to do, and and, and a, a more uh, risk um, uh, hungry for risk party, uh, risk tolerant party to do it. Um, but I think we might start seeing those anyway, even even without sort of like the uh, AM. So it may you may actually end up being able to get a lot of those. And then I'll just say I think even with off chain. Um, uh, you know, even if it's not possible to just have a smart contract managing your liquidity, it doesn't necessarily mean it's impossible to have retail liquidity provision. Um, you could have just like someone like open source code for bots that do this, right? That provide liquidity. Um, so I think the idea that oh, you know, just because you know, it's it's the smart contract manages your liquidity, it's so much easier for you. It's like maybe crypto enables uh, passive liquidity provision in other ways where we can give you the tools to actually do that um, to follow particular whatever strategy you want. Um, uh, off chain, but again, I think that's that's it's all a little speculative. But I do think we're starting to see things move in that direction. Yeah, and for for listeners, I I also read when Robert put out that thread about Jared from Subway and his particular strategy. And if you, actually we'll we'll link it in the show notes just because it's it's kind of a cool story. But in in general, if you're a Mev bot, you need to manage inventory. Most people just safely want to warehouse ETH as inventory. But I think Jared's strategy, if I remember this correctly, was he actually had a healthy inventory of Pepe and he was willing to take uh, directional risk there. He got in very early to Pepe and then he provided, uh, you know, he basically did back run, very profitable back runs with his Pepe inventory, which is a super interesting strategy. This might provide a use case for long tail um, lending, borrowing and lending. Because if you if you were a market maker, professional market maker who wanted to market make these long tokens, or if you're like Jared from Subway who wants to sandwich attack them, um, then Conceivably, you could hedge that delta. You could hedge the risk that you take on your inventory risk by borrowing that token. But right now, you can't really borrow those. And none of the long tail lending protocols have really found product market fit. Like you know, like Euler Fuse. Like it's it is le- seems to be less demand for long tail borrowing. But that seems like it should provide that. So if we have that primitive really nailed down, maybe people could do that. But it's sort of a tangent from our discussion. That'd be super cool. You know what? I and actually that it was the writing it was the blog post for blend which really like nailed home there was a there was a section in there about assuming a more sophisticated supply side for blend and i was like man that is probably the right assumption i just to see it just written out like that something that had been gestating for a little while i was like that probably does seem like a pretty safe good assumption that's right i, I bet this is something we'll talk about in uh, more in future episodes but i do think the the, exi- the existence of just one side is going to be retail and the other side is going to be professionalized. That as, as a rule, I think is, has, uh, I think you, you maybe even had something, um, to sign to this effect in a previous ep- recent episode, hmm. but I, I think it's, I think it's an important, um, uh, so often important compromise to make. Yeah. I maybe to go off on a little bit of a tangent, but Eugene said this and I do feel the, the need to like market makers will be bridges. So this was a big takeaway that I had when I, when I came back from ECC, this year, um, this was one of the, the takeaways that I that I had, which is I think there are many different incentives out there right now for market makers to provide either temporary or sort of permanent um, fixes to cross chain interop that are very difficult today. And the the phrase that I would use is the bridges. They kind of or market makers actually warehouse risk, and that's at a high level what what bridges do as well. They solve inventory problems across two different ecosystems and environments. We talked about it a little bit within the context of there's still friction, obviously, interoperability between different chains. An intense-based architecture is a way to get around that, but it relies on uh, market makers or or builders or solvers or whatever whatever you want to call it standing in there and and solving that inventory problem. There's also, I don't really want to get too far into the weeds here, but also the, you know, if we end up in some sort of, um, if ZK is the end game tech for Ethereum and we do... You know, Sig- Doug was getting into this with co-process, but signatures and aggregated signatures and sort of the fixed costs of uh, transaction go up, which is you're going to need big builders to do that as well. Um, but all, all of this kind of points to this idea of market makers standing in and solving the fragmented liquidity and different ecosystems that exist today. Are you are you a believer in that idea as well? Or uh, what, what do you think about that idea? Yeah, ab- absolutely. I mean, I think in general, the best way to solve a problem often is just to create an incentive for it to be solved and open up a global a competition for that. 
Um, and you know, I think competition can't, doesn't solve every problem, and it can cause often cause uh, problems. And in, in many ways, MEV is a problem, and uh, competition is the is the cause of that problem. Um, but it, but yeah, in general, I think a lot of of problems, um, uh, a lot of problems can can could be addressed by just trying to say, okay, like what if we just assume you know that someone will make create a profit incentive for people to do it, and then see if if people come in and do that, and it's going to tend to lead to professionals doing it. Um, but ultimately that, that might be okay, especially if it's a competitive market. And we got into this a bit with Doug on the call, but if you assume that if, if the existing competitors were to drop out, that someone else would come in and take their place, um, that might be okay. Even if, even if there's like currently some, some that are winning this game, because you know, if they, if they, uh, drop out, someone else comes in. We've seen some of this, I think with, uh, uh with various, various parts in MEV and building and block building and liquidity provision, um, this sort of big tournament where all some players may be dominant at particular times, but ultimately it's so competitive that it is actually, it's even if someone disappears, someone else will take their place. Yeah. I was actually listening to a podcast done by Hart Lambert recently, uh, where he was describing some of the dynamics of treasury markets and there are very, there are very few participants, but it's actually an extremely competitive market with very tight pricing. And it's like, you know, an auction that's typically run between like four participants and we we should in future episodes we'll, we'll get deep into the sort of auction theory and some of the different designs and like how like how auctions can be run and the design decisions there but you know it, it's something that gets debated about about how many participants you really need to run a competitive one and i think the takeaway that at least i've had thus far i could reserve the right to change mind but it could be a, a relatively small number yeah um i i guess just to i guess just to close out I did want to get your thoughts on what we talked about in terms of designing in gas constrained uh, environments. I know that was a big motivator for UniV UniV four, even the the singleton contract. Doug also shift, shifted the architecture of uh, ambient finance to be based on a single contract. I, I'd love to maybe because I think that kind of got lost in the UniV four announcement amid the amidst the hooks. Um, but just talk a little bit about how you you think about kind of. Um, you know, the cost of gas when you're building as, as a DEX and how that informed maybe V4. Yeah. So for the first thing I'll say is I think, uh, V4's gas optimizations, while I think it's, um, uh, it's pretty important. We're all kind of in like the, it's, it's still in the constant factor gas optimization range. And so it, I think, you know, when you, unless you get like orders of magnitude of, of improvement, um, in that, you're still ultimately, um, you know, you're shaving off some points and it's necessary for it to stay competitive. But ultimately, I think it doesn't necessarily change that much about what kinds of models are competitive. And that's why, again, I still I still think the AMM um, model to, uh, is dominant on Ethereum, even even and even on Ethereum rollups, because just like you actually, if there's any cost at all to placing orders, um, often a central limit order book is a problem. And that's, you're not going to just like shave off enough gas to do that. But yeah, I, I think it's really important in part because, you know, it's a competitive game on chain um, and the... Uh, you know, reducing the gas cost uh, is really important for getting volume, other volume. It also means it also like fixes almost every other problem, right? Or, or, or mitigates a lot, a lot of other problems. Lever is reduced if you reduce the gas cost. Uh, the um, amount of you know, obviously swappers uh, pay less, um, but like yeah, but like liquidity providers make more uh, make more money ultimately. It's one of the few like uh, kind of almost truly zero uh, non zero sum. Um, optimizations you can make because you also get and you also get more volume. You will you actually you know have potentially we talked about this a bit. The same of like dead weight loss. The protocol might even make more money even if it's, if you're burning less heat because you have less gas because just more volume is happening and there's more room on the chain for other stuff, other uh, positive activities to go on. So I think it's it's one reason I think we keep a hard brain on it is it is it feels like this is an area where the tech can really advance in a way that's that's really winner take uh, not, not winner take all but but uh, everyone wins win win you know without revealing any trade secrets and you know have you, have you ever looked at Solana as sort of a compelling environment where obviously the the gas cost is is much lower I don't know how much you've paid attention there or if the focus of sort of you and, and paradigm is mostly still on ethereum yeah I mean I think we've looked pretty closely at Solana I do think um and I think it makes it makes a lot of reasonable uh, trade-offs if your goal again is to is to max out throughput and I think it's it's remarkable in fact how high you can get throughput if you just say like that's that's the main thing the main thing we're going to prioritize um I think one uh in the long run I'm not actually sure and I I should maybe should have argued with Eugene a little more on this I'm not sure it really changes the fact that you're working in ultimately this constrained environment because like eventually you're going to just fill up this synchronous environment and you're going to you know in fact like for various MEV reasons, you would really expect it to happen. And we've seen this happen with L2, certainly, is that like, no matter how much you just scale, 
um, you know, no matter how much you sort of turn the throughput up, it's actually in the incentive of people to basically like spam your chain until um, until it's full. And so they will. And so ultimately, I think, you know, there's no unless you like completely change the model, you're going to end up having to face these issues. And I think they're kind of just like pre dealing with congestion. And of course, Solana had its issues with congestion um, at times. And I think, you know, it's I think it's somewhat past those. But I think if you end up with a lot of usage on a chain, you will end up with with ultimately some congestion. Um, I think almost as a law of nature, just because com competition will will happen until there is congestion. Solana has made some interesting interesting strides in their local fee market. But I think in DEXs especially, there's reasons why like the hot state will actually just be get congested. So no matter how you how you solve it, if you have it, I think there's a, there's this kind of quadrilemma where if you if you have permissionless access where anyone can trade on it, you have low transaction fees. Um, uh, and then you're just going to actually end up with, uh, and, and you have censorship resistance, then you're going to end up with uh, a denial of service attack effectively on it because people, everyone's going to be trying to trade at the exact same time. I do wonder if Solana ends up changing their, now we're getting into discussion about Solana, but I do wonder if they end up changing their fee market. They they, they already have, I think, uh, I forget, it's not, maybe it's not a priority fee, but it's something like a priority fee that you can, that you can yeah. pay for. I think paying the fee market where you pay, where it's like state specific, I think is great, but I think you're still going to have that problem on DEXs eventually. Um, I, I think it's it may be impossible to avoid in a decentralized blockchain. Yeah, you might be right. Um, Dan, this has been a ton of fun. This this next episode, we're actually going. This this was a good lead in because we talked a little bit about the OFA design space and intents, and that's what we're going to be diving into in our next episode. So, um, a lot of people, a lot of I don't I don't know if there's a lot of people out there who love that, but definitely the people who do are very passionate. So uh, if that's for you guys, definitely tune in. So we'll uh, we'll see you next week.